Sunday morning. What do we do on Sunday morning? We go down to the church house, don't we? Come to worship God. It don't always mean you're going to feel like going. But you do something enough and you'll start feeling it, amen. That's the problem with the world. They're willing to do all these wicked things. Sometimes they don't even want to, but they'll get the feeling that you just keep on loving God and serving God and showing up and he'll make a way for you to do what you need to be doing. And thank God for these young people. Mason on the stage this morning, amen. Playing the bait. Man, I thank God for that. If it was up to me to play it, we'd be in trouble. We'd be baseless. That's what we'd be. Somebody would be cutting my box off over there where you couldn't hear me. You just, you just do what God wants you to do, and you'd be faithful and hang around. And when, when it's your turn to be on stage, God will put you on stage. He'll over. I, I, I remember Miss Hannah. We had a piano player, a good one. Miss Hannah taught her set to play the piano. Where is she going to use it? She uses it every service now, Amen. Yeah. You just do what you're supposed to be doing and be faithful and be where you're supposed to be and God will open them doors when it's his time. I thank God for that. Turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 24 this morning. 2 Chronicles 24. Remember the pastor and our folks down in Mississippi? He's down there preaching that meeting. Be coming home tomorrow if the Lord don't come back. If he does, all those that'll be born, all those of us that are born again will be home, Amen. amen. I wonder who's going to show up for church after that. That'd be sad. Somebody's going to show up for church. The next appointed time, somebody's going to show up. That's going to be a sad time, isn't it? When God sends you a strong delusion, believe a lie. Why? Because you don't, you go crazy. You're going to believe a lie where everybody went. You better believe on Lord Jesus Christ. Well, you got your right mind about you and why there's time. Second Chronicles 24, two verses this morning. Look at verse number one. The Bible says, Joash was seven years old when he began to reign. So it had a seven-year-old king. Boy, that sounds like trouble, don't it? You let your seven-year-old run your house for a little bit and see how that goes. They're going to have you going to bed at 7.30 and eating all that junk you don't like. Joash was seven years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Zibia of Beersheba, and Joash did that which was right in the sight of the Lord all the days of Jehoiada the priest. The title of the message this morning is Apostasy of a King. <coughs> brother D'Angelo, how about pray for us, brother? So here we have a young king named Joash, and uh, he was king of the southern kingdom. And there was a time when all Israel was one, all the tribes. Uh, most Bible commentators and people call it the United Kingdom stage. And uh, David brought that together through winning wars, and he was God's man. And the first king Israel had was Saul. God had it ordained, had it set up to, for Israel to be run by judges. And Israel didn't want it. And they said, give us a king like all the other nations. So God gave them their king, the one they wanted first. That was Saul. But his man, David, came second. Man after God's own heart. He began to fight the wars and win the wars. He was eventually anointed king of Judah. Not the other 11 tribes, but eventually they came to his side, anointed him king. He was king over all Israel. But of course, anything man's involved in, they're going to make a mess of it. So his son Solomon, his reign was a type of the millennial reign of Christ. Had peace all about, they were wealthy, they had plenty, Israel did. But he began to apostatize and turn from the Lord. And his son Rehoboam came about and God split the kingdom, Rehoboam and Jeroboam. And Rehoboam, he took the two southern tribes, Judah and Benjamin. And Jeroboam, he took the northern tribes, the other ten tribes. And we know the capital of the northern tribes was Samaria. And they were idol worshipers. Jeroboam didn't want his people going down to Jerusalem, so he made two golden calves. 
He put one in, in Samaria. He put one in Dan. He said, y'all boys ain't got to go all the way down there. Y'all just stay up here and worship these gods. They apostatized. Northern and southern kingdom. The northern kingdom had over its period of four or five hundred years maybe, they had 19 kings. Every one of them without exception was wicked. Every, Ahab, he was a northern king, a king of the northern tribes. The southern tribes had 19 kings, had 20 rulers. One of them was a woman. She was wicked. But they had 19 kings. Of those 19, eight of them were good godly men. That's still less than, less than half, but it's a lot better than zero, isn't it? And you read through these accounts, these kings, there's a northern king named Joash also. Don't be confused. If you read the scriptures, read them in context, you'll be able to plainly tell which is which. Say, well, how do I remember the northern and the southern and the bad and the good? It's easy. Just remember north, bad, and south, good. Amen. <laughs> All the congregation except for Andrea said amen. <laughs> but that's the way it was. Kings. And we're going to look at this man here this morning. His name was Joash. And he was a good king. Uh, had a hard, tough upbringing. His father, the king, was killed when he was a baby. And his grandmother saw that he was dead, so she was going to take the throne. And had all of his sons killed. Except for one. A lady took this Joash and hid him, hid him in the temple. And when he was seven years old, this man of God, Jehovah the priest, he said, it's time that we have a good king instead of this woman. So they anointed him king. The lady was killed. And here he is, a seven-year-old boy, ruling and reigning in Jerusalem, the kingdom of Judah. Well, how's that work? Seven-year-old can't rule and reign? He had people helping him is what he had. He had this man, Jehoiada, leading the way. So here's this boy, had a miraculous salvation when he was a baby. He was installed as king at age seven, and he had this man, Jehoiada, this good, godly man to guide him. And that verse number two says, and Joash did that which was right in the sight of the Lord all the days of Jehovah the priest. Thank God for a good, strong man to lead and guide in your life, a good, strong spiritual man, whether it be a husband or a father or a pastor. And I put them in that order because that's the way they go in your life. The pastor is not the head of your home. He's the head of this church. That's the way God's ordained it. This local church, this local assembly, the pastor is the spiritual head of it, and he leads and guides through his preaching and his teaching and his life. But when you get in that car and you go home, sir, you are the head of that home. You yourself. It's a problem in this old world. A lot of homes, men are not the spiritual head. Thank God for a woman that's willing to step in that role, but God's not ordained it so. So here was this man. He had a good, strong, godly man in his life. And he did some good things for God. He began to rebuild the house of God. Man, thank God for that. But when that strong man of God died, like all people are going to, this man's life fell apart. It just completely crumbled and fell apart. You know, your mama's had you in church and daddy's had you in church and they raised you right and they've taught you and you know the songs and you know how to act, you know how to dress and they beat you when you needed it and all the things that, that, that just children need. But you know what? There comes a time in every person's life, whether they be a man or a woman, when you have to do it for themselves. Daddy can't do it anymore for you, and mama can't do it anymore for you, and, 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 and children are in church, and they grow up, and they become teenagers, and they become young adults, and we see some of them stick around and serve God and thank God for it. But we see so many, when that time comes, they walk out that door. That's the difference in a professor and a possessor. If you're going to live for God and love God and serve God, you have to have something yourself. So here was this man. He was raised up under this man of God, Jehoiada. The man of God died. And this Joash fell into apostasy. 
Now, what's apostasy? That's turning your back on something that you always profess to believe. Shout it, sing it, talk it, testify it, but one day you turn your back on that and you walk away from it. That's apostasy. And we see it. And you know what? We as parents, we as men and women, spiritual men and women, we can see that a lot of times in people, can't we? Even before sometimes the people see it themselves, you can see it on someone. You know the best way to take care of things is catch it early. I am the world's worst about I ain't going to no doctor. Y'all know when I say ain't, it's serious business. I ain't going. I'm hurt. I'm sick. I don't care. I ain't going. But you know what? If you do a little bit of preventative maintenance, that thing might help you. You ain't not going to change the oil in your truck. If you catch something early, sometimes it'll help you head it off at the pass, so to speak. So I want to talk about some things we're going to see in this man, young man's life Signs of apostasy. And it might be that you can look at your life and say, hey, this guy's talking about me. I'm seeing this in my life myself. Maybe I need some help from God. Signs to look for. First, look at verse number 17 with me. Second Chronicles 24 and verse number 17. So here's this man, Joash. He's the king. Some of these scriptures that talk about it also call him Jehoash, same man. Look at verse 17. It says, Now after the death of Jehoiada, Jehoiada was 130 years old when he died. So when he began to mentor and tutor this young man, he was 100 years old. Well, I'm too old to do something for God. Man, no, you ain't. God can use you. Look at verse 17, what it says. Now after the death of Jehoiada, came the princes of Judah and made obeisance to the king. Then the king hearkened unto them. You know what's the sign of apostasy coming into someone's life and the start of apostasy is friendship with the world. This old world's nasty and it's filthy and it hates God and it hates you and it wouldn't like anything better than to suck you up and get you away from God's people and God's house and God's book and chew you up and spit you out and leave you laying beside the highway. That's what this old world would love to have. You realize the world is always ready to creep in. There's a time we sleep. Guess what? The world never sleeps. It is always ready to creep in any time the door is cracked. God was speaking to Cain. He said, in Genesis 4, he said, why are thou wroth? Then when he said, he said, why is thy countenance fallen? You can tell a lot by a man or a woman's countenance. You can tell a lot by a child's countenance. Child come in, they pouty lip, and they lip run out, and they mad, and they scared to say nothing because they ain't going to say too much because they know you'll beat them. Well, what you asking? What's the matter with you? Hey, you know something's the matter with them. Her countenance has fallen. You see it in grown people. You know how to knock down, drag out with your wife at home, and them about had a fist fight, and all kind of things. Y'all don't do that, I know, but some people do that. <laughs> then you come in the church house. But you can tell something's wrong with the countenance, can't you? Why? It's an issue. There's a problem. Countenance is falling. You see it, some people, man, they saved and served the Lord, and boy, they just grinning and laughing and happy and joyful, and then next time you see them, the countenance falling. Ain't got nothing to say. Next time you see them, the countenance falling. After a month, they can't know what's happening. Something's creeping in. Something's creeping in. And God told Cain, he said, If thou doest well... Thou be accepted. You know what you need to do when the world's trying to keep in? You just keep on doing what you do right here. You keep on reading that Bible. You keep on praying. You keep on serving God. You keep on coming down to the church house. If you do well, God will help make a way. But then God said, 
but have not seen life at the door. That world's always right there waiting you to crack that door. Y'all seen an old TV show where the full of brush man, y'all heard of him? The full of brush, used to be door to door salesman. We, we, we Amazon people now, ain't we? Everybody coming to my door, I'm going to cut the middle man out, amen? But that's door to door salesman, come to the door, he'd knock on that door, and the woman come open the door, and she said, no, not interested, and he'd go to shut the door. What'd that man do? He'd stick his foot in the door. Well, she couldn't shut the door. You know what the devil's always wanting to do? If you crack that door, he's going to stick his foot in that door. And it might not have been hard to open that door, but buddy, you're going to have a hard time getting that door shut again. That's how it works. The world is always waiting to step in. Sin is at the door waiting for you to crack that door and let it in. It will never miss an opportunity. All it takes is a crack. So that ain't going to happen to me. Y'all ever heard of David? Y'all heard of David, haven't you? The Bible says he was a man after God's own heart. You know what the Bible, you know what God has never in writing that I know of put down about me? I'm a man after God's own heart. Probably ain't put it down about you either, but he did about David. Godly man. You know what David did? David cracked that door one day. You know where it starts? It starts right here. It starts in the head. Let it in the gates. And if we play with it and mess around with it, where does it go to? It goes to the heart. When it gets in the heart, you know where it manifests itself? It'll manifest itself in your home. Oh, preacher, I don't know about that. Hold your place here. Turn to 2 Samuel chapter 11 with me. Let me show you. 2 Samuel chapter number 11. Hold your place here. We're going to come back. 2 Samuel chapter number 11. David the king. Man after God's own heart. That's what the Bible says. Look at verse number 1. 2 Kings chapter number 11, verse number Here's the story of David and Bathsheba. And we know the story. Look what it says about it. Look at verse number 1. And it came to pass after the year was expired, at the time when kings went forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. So David was not where he was supposed to be doing what he was supposed to be doing. Right. Look what happened. Verse 2. And it came to pass in an eventide that David arose from off his bed. He lay around the bed in the evening. And walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look, on, look upon. What happened? Got his head, didn't it? He saw that woman. What, where he was supposed to be, he was not doing what he was supposed to be doing. And he saw that woman that got in his head. But you know what happened next? Look what it says. And David sent and inquired after the woman. So it got from his head, where did it go to next? His heart. He began to choir after woman, found out who she was. But then look what happened. Look at verse number four. And David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her. It went from his head to his heart to his home. What happened? That sin was right there waiting on David to crack that door. And he did, and it came in, and it troubled him for the rest of his life. Can God forgive? Absolutely God can forgive. But you know what? There's such a thing in the Bible as reaping and sowing. We need to be aware that this world hates us and hates what we stand for, and every time we crack that door to it, it's waiting to stick its foot in and get on the inside. We need to be aware. Know what it's like. I've given this illustration for sins like a python. Y'all know what a python is, one of them big old sneakers. You can go down to Florida and get one of them now, amen. But a python, people think, oh, he'll just take, he'll crush you. He can't just crush you. If he gets wrapped up around you, you're in trouble. You was in bad trouble. But as long as you can hold your breath and hold yourself, he can't crush you. But you know what he does? Every time you 
let a little breath out, he gets a little tighter. And you never get it back. You let another little breath out, and he gets a little tighter. And you never get it back. That's the way sin is. You give a little bit, and you play with a little bit, and you play with a little bit, and you give a little bit, and every bit you get, it takes it. And if you don't wake up and turn to God and get help, it will kill you dead. This old world will appeal to your flesh. Turn to James 4 with me. Let me show you something. James chapter number 4. James 4. This old world will appeal to your flesh and your eyes, and it'll look so good, and it'll look so shiny. It'll look so enticing. And the Bible plainly declares there is pleasure in sin for a season. But what you're going to have to pay it's not going to equal up with what you receive. It never works. It's going to cost you more than you want to pay is the way the old saying goes. Look at James 4. Look at verse number 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do you think that the scripture is saying in vain the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy. You cannot be friends with the world and love and serve God. We go out in this old world and we work. The Bible says if a man don't work, neither should he eat. You need to get you a stinking job if you ain't got one. Not I said the S word. You got in this old world and you work. You got in this old world and you shop. And we go places in the world, just because we're in this world does not mean we have to be of this world. Loving this world and loving the things of the world is different than having a function in this world that God's given us. You cannot be friends with the world and love the things of this world and serve God like he wants you to. It's impossible. It cannot be done. They are contrary the one to another. You know how we do. We want to get close as we can. We want to know exactly where that line is. Because the closer we can get that line, the more this world we can have, we ain't going to step over it. And the whole time it's just killing us. The world. Joash let the world in. And these men that came to him, we're going to say they turned his heart. All these things he was doing from God, he began to listen to them, and he turned from the things of God and turned to the things of the world. Are you where you were at one time? Or has something or someone came in and taken the edge off? But that fire for the things of God you had at one time, is it still burning bright as it was? Or has it been beaten down and tamped down? This world feeds the flesh. The flesh and the spirit are contrary one to another. Let me tell you something. Only one of them can rule. And I'm not talking about your salvation this morning. That's the first thing people will know. Well, when can I lose my salvation? You can't. I'm talking about your life and living and loving God and serving God. Your flesh and your spirit cannot both rule and reign. Don't work that way. Turn back to 2 Chronicles 24. 2 Chronicles 24. See, it begins, apostasy begins with affinity with the world. That's where it starts. We begin to dabble and look and click when we shouldn't. And watch when we shouldn't. And look when we shouldn't. And go places we shouldn't. And these things, they begin to be on our mind. Now, the Bible tells us to meditate on the Word of God, but we find ourselves meditating on these other things of the world. That's where it begins. Look where it leads to. Look at verse 18. 2 Chronicles 24 and 18. And they left the house of the Lord God of their fathers, and served groves and idols, and wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem for their trespass. 
It begins with the world, affinity with the world. Do you know what happens? You fall out, man. You're no longer in your place. You know, like, and, and we talk about your place. Like somehow the pastor's ordained everyone a place. You know why that's your place? Because that's where God puts you. That's where God himself puts you to love him and to worship him corporately and to serve him and to grow in the grace of the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, right where you are. The world comes in, affinity with the world, and the next thing we know, we fall out. Man, that won't happen to me. <laughs> it's happened better to me and me and you. It's happened to better ladies than you. It's happened to better children than what you got. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. You know when you fall out, you know when you fall out, when you got more on the outside than you got on the inside. Like old Eutychus, right? Y'all remember Paul preached about four or five hours? Y'all would have went to sleep too? I probably would have. I ain't even ashamed. I probably just laid down the floor and went to sleep, but. Some of y'all would try to maintain the sleep waste, but, but old Eutychus, he just couldn't take it no more. He was in that window, and he fell asleep, and he fell out. You know, if he'd have had more in, which way would he have fell? He'd have fell and hit the floor, wouldn't he? I was sitting there this morning, I heard little Kenny, I hear about there. I thought, what is that? She was asleep, man. That's a blessing. She's a little baby. She wasn't like snoring. She was like sleep breathing. I'd much rather have my sleep in the house of God than I had a wake at home when it's church time. I would. Little Joe's about there whining and squeaking like a little pig. I'd much rather have him in here doing that than I'd have him calm and cool out in this old world. These kids don't always do right in here. You don't always do right. I'd much rather have them not doing right in here. We can love them and help them and train them and pray for them and show them. And I had out in this old world that hates them is going to embrace all that mess. You know, when you fall out like these men, they let the world in, and you got more on the outside than you do the inside, you're going to fall out. Hey, don't fall asleep on the outside. There ain't no help out there. Those counselors can't help you. And those worldly people, they cannot help you. You need spiritual help from spiritual people. It's what you need. Eutychus fell out and died. That's what the Bible says. People think to turn into the world and forsaken the church. Well, I just get along like everybody else does. I think a kid, you, you ain't like everybody else. It'll kill anybody. But a lot of them people ain't been raised in church. A lot of them people don't know. A lot of them people don't know there is a God. Know what God's merciful to us, what he is. But you know what? You know. You and I know. We've been taught and raised and preached to, and we read this book, and we prayed, and we know you get out in this old world and turn from the things of God and it will kill you. The God of this world, listen to me, he wants you dead. Do you understand that? The God of this world, Satan, 2 Corinthians 4, 4, he wants you dead. Yeah. That's what he wants. This old world looks so good and the pleasures and entertainments and the joys of it. There ain't nothing in the world but Satan won't pick people People think you got to be old to die. You do not have to be old to die. You get out in this old world running around acting like a bunch of fools and it will kill you. That's what Satan wants. Jesus said he came to, that you might have life and have it more abundantly. This is the best life. You ain't got to live it like me, but loving God and serving God is the best life there is. Till we go home to heaven. You know what that verse says, verse 18? It says, and wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem. 
They let the world in, begin to chase after things in the world, and they turned their back on the things of God. And the Bible says the wrath of God fell on them. Well, yeah, preacher, but they were serving idols. I ain't serving no idol. I'm just having a good time. I still help the little old lady cross the street. And I still give to a good cause to help somebody. I still do these things. I'm not bowing down to an idol. Listen to me. Anything you forsake the things of God for is an idol. I don't care if it's a person, a place, or a thing. You know, you and I need all the preaching we can get. We just do. Why? Because we're quick to forget, aren't we? We're quick to forget. Study at home is great. You need to study at home. But you need to be in a local Bible-believing church serving God with God's people. You can, listen to me, you can never, never be as strong as God wants you to be without being a part of a church. You can't do it. God send you down to the tip of South America. You might can, but you ain't going to do it here. Not with God's people hubbed up five minutes from your house, gathered around loving God and serving God. It can't be done. This man, Joash, he apostatized. He let the world in. He turned his back on the things of God. And we look at the church, right? When a preacher ain't have it today. Y'all done said that before. Don't look at me like that. Ever been a day when you didn't have it? Ain't about him. Ain't about you. It's about God. Getting a hold of God. Ain't about the preacher. Ain't about the singing. Ain't about the youth group, the children's church. It's about God and doing what he says he wants you to do. You know thing about forsaking the church? Very few people just cut that thing off cold. They'll miss a little bit, and they'll come back. And they'll miss a little bit more. They'll come back. You need to think about doing something. Every time you do something, it gets a little bit easier. Think about your job. First time you walked on your job, you were like, what in the world's going on right here? After about a month, you had that thing down a little bit. You've been doing it a year now, and you can do it with your eyes closed. Same thing with the things of God. Every time you forsake the things of God and doing what you know God wants you to be doing, next time it gets a little bit easier. So we see here, apostasy begins with letting the world in a little bit. Affinity, friendship with the world. And it leads to forsaking the things of God. Do you know what it leads to? It leads to forsaking this book. Forsaking this book. Look at verse number 19. 2 Chronicles 24 19. Yet he sent prophets to them to bring them again unto the Lord, and they testified against them, but they would not give ear. And the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada. This man, Jehoiada, that led and God. God got a Joash all his life into right things. His son came to him. But look what he did. The priest which stood above the people said unto them, Thus saith God, Why transgress ye the commandments of the Lord that ye cannot prosper? Because ye have forsaken the Lord, he hath also forsaken you. And they conspired against him and stoned him with stones at the commandment of the king in the court of the house of the Lord. God sent them a man, and what did he give them? He gave them his words. You know, you and I have his words. You know where apostasy begins when you let the world in? You start letting the world in, you got some trouble in your life. Just do. But then if you let that in, entertain those thoughts, it gets in your mind, gets in your heart, gets in your home, then you'll turn your back on the things of God. Get out in this old world, boy, you in trouble then. But you ever met anybody and they're out in this old world and they quit on God and, and you talk to them and say, well, I know that's what 
preacher always said in that Bible, he said, but I, don't, but I don't know if that's true anymore. You ever talk to anybody like that? Doubting what they profess to be true one time, that this King James Bible are the words of God. You ever met anybody like that? I have. I have. Well, I got this book, and this guy, he used these other scriptures. And you know what? What he says is right. So these other books are true too. Somebody gets out in this old world and quit on church, a lot of them, when you call them and talk to them and see them, they still reading things and still studying things. Do you know what they've done? They've turned from God's word. Turned to a bunch of fables is what they've turned to. That's a bad place to be. What happened? The love's wax cold. Love God at one time, was on fire for God one time, believed this book one time, and stood on this book and testified about this book, how great this book was, and it was God's word, but now all of a sudden, things are a little bit different. Got some new friends to help you see that it ain't got to exactly be like that. Why ain't it got to be like that if God says it's got to be like that? Some of them will know new words. You get some preachers that tell you, the Greek says, the Hebrew says, or Joyce Meyer said, or Joel Osteen said. What, 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 what did the man say? We're in sad shape when the two most popular preachers in the country are a feminine man and a manly woman. I've seen that George Myers. Hate to meet her in a dark alley. She's like, she'd be tough, boy. <laughs> New friends will help you see. It ain't got to be like that. We can love God, love God. It's grace and it's about freedom and living what like we want and doing. And we can have these things of the world and still love God and serve God. You know what that is? That's the worst kind of wickedness, what that is. That's the worst kind of wickedness. You see somebody in this old world, and they're wicked as devil, and they're drinking and cussing and fighting and shooting. You know what they are. But some people are wolves in sheep's clothing, and they're just as bad and just as wicked. But they got a Jesus mask on. You know what somebody do when they get like this? Just like Joash. They won't receive what God says to them. I'm talking about the Bible this morning. Rejection of this Bible is a sign of apostasy. Question is, what about you? Do you still believe it like that? I hope you do. Do you still believe it's God's word? Do you still believe it's a drop down, drop dead, plumb line that whether I understand it or not is true? Some people don't believe it like that anymore. You know what you can't do? You cannot get the right answer out of the wrong book. You can't do it. You'll flunk that test every time. I mentioned his former man, brother Jeff, went and took that contract test. He had a stack of books about that high. What in the world? Somehow he passed that thing. You ain't going to get the right answer out of the wrong book. Apostasy is a creeping disease. It doesn't happen overnight. It's little by little. It's step by step. You know what the last thing happens in apostasy? Is you forget where you come from. What do you mean by that? You forget where God has brought you from. Look at verse number 22 with me. Thus, Joash the king remembered not the kindness which Jehoiada his father had done to him, but slew his son. And when he died, he said, The Lord look upon it, and required. 
last step of apostasy is you forget where you come from. You forget where you were before God found you. You forget what kind of mess you were in before God found you. We walk right and we talk right and we live right and God's blessed our life and we have so much and we, we're not careful. We'll get out in this old world, get a hold of things in the world, turn from the things of God, turn from his book and we'll forget it ain't always been like this. You ain't always had that wife you got. That's a good, godly woman. You ain't always had that husband you got that's a good, godly man. You ain't always had those children in your life. You ain't always had this church. You ain't always had these friends that'll love you and help you and support you. We forget there's a time you was out in this old world and you didn't have nobody. You didn't have anything. This old world hated you. Every time you tried to get up, somebody was kicking your feet out from under you and they said they were friends and they claimed to be friends, but you know what? When it come right down to it, they were never there to help you. They were never willing to make a sacrifice to help you. We forget that one time we were in the miry clay. We start thinking that somehow, man, I've done it. I got my stuff right. I got me a good job, wife, home, family. You know, I have really, I have really, I have really turned this thing around. You got when you couldn't scrape two nickels together, couldn't make a living. When you hated your job and hated your life and hated everything about your life. You forgot before God moved in. Moved on the inside and let you know somebody loved you. Somebody there to help you. Somebody there to listen to that whining and crying we do in the middle of the night when we're heartbroken. Somebody there to listen to you and not just listen to you, they'll hear you and not just hear you, but they'll help you. Someone that there's never a time you can't go to them. When our heart's troubled and we're down and depressed and we don't know which way to turn, someone that we can turn to and they'll help us and hear us and love us. Someone that the Bible says will never forsake you. The last stage of apostasy, you forget where you come from. You turn from God, forget how good God's been to you, and you mark my words, your life will fall apart. My wife going to leave me. She might not. My husband going to leave me. He might not. But your life, your peace, your joy, your children, your family, they will fall apart if you turn your back on God and the things of God. Listen to me. Don't forget how good God's been to you. You may have been out. You may have been trying to ride that fence, one foot on either side, got more out and you got in, but listen to me. God will take you back today. God will help you. He'll receive you into himself. The Bible says that we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He'll restore you. He'll restore your marriage. He'll restore your children. He'll restore your family. He'll restore your joy. He'll restore your peace. He's the only one that can restore these things. question is, do you want it? Do you see a need? So, but preacher, I ain't got that need. You know somebody that's got that need. You love somebody that's got that need. Why don't we pray for them that God would touch them and help them? Heads bowed and eyes closed. Apostasy of a king if it can happen to a king, it can happen to you and I. God wants to help you. God wants to help you this morning. Know where it all starts? 
It all starts with salvation. 